as a housewife reveals her secrets. And he was shot by a hunter, but was it an accident or murder? And was she a grieving widow? I remember screaming for help. Or a black widow? Plus, an ordinary family, but everything is not as it seems. The husband stalked like prey. My uh, brake lines have been cut. Then killed in cold blood. My husband and I have been shot. A tale of lust, strange phone calls, and a premonition of murder. Hello and welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Women who marry men, kill them, and then move on. They've been the mainstays of Hollywood melodramas for years, but they exist in real life, too. They're known as black widows, and they're the central figures in these three stories. Our first involves a brutal murder and an unlikely cast of characters. A small-town banker, a corporate executive with a Harvard MBA, and a soccer mom with a secret past. As Jim Avila first reported in 2005, it took over two decades for the truth to be discovered. At the center of a small Kansas town lies a peaceful campus, Mid-American Nazarene, a place for students who long to live their lives in the character of Christ. And yet it is here in this peaceful place that the seeds of betrayal are sown. It is here that violence rips through a marriage and then a town, leaving behind a blood-soaked crime scene and a mystery that will take 22 years to solve. But that was murder, and to begin with murder is to jump ahead. This is a tale that starts with love. It was a doe-eyed beauty, Melinda Lambert, who stole the heart of young David Harmon at a Nazarene Christian youth camp in 1973. David's father remembers. I felt that David had uh, met the right girl. Uh, she was vivacious, uh, she was full of life, uh, just outgoing. Soon after, Melinda and David were married. The two began a simple, quiet life. David working at the local bank and Melinda in the dean's office of Mid-American Nazarene. Their social lives revolved around the church and those who know them are struck by David's devotion to Melinda. Kevin Jakubowski was David's close friend. I think he kind of idolized her. I don't know. That's the only way I'd know how to put it. I think he really, really was enamored and in love with his wife. I really believe that. But soon, Melinda meets a new friend at work, a younger, extremely charismatic student leader, Mark Mangelsdorf. Chris Lanius, now a Nazarene pastor, was one of Mark Mangelsdorf's closest friends. There was not a person that I thought more highly of than Mark. Uh, he was probably the most intelligent, mature, moral, Christian young man, the kind of guy you'd want your sister to date. It's Melinda who brings Mark into her marriage, introduces her new friend to her husband, David. They play racquetball and attend church together regularly. They had kind of adopted Mark as a, the student pet project, and, but I had no idea how much time they were spending together because he never talked about it. After a while, Mark spends so much time at the Harmon's home that he almost seems to be a member of the family. I would pass by their house on a daily basis and would see Mark's car over there. And it was there all the time. And it seemed a little strange to me, but I just kind of chalked it up as, you know, they've taken him under their wing. Then, on a cold, dark night, the intense friendship between the three would take on a more sinister light. It is February 28, 1982, when police get a frantic call. Olathe Detective J.W. Larrick is one of the first at the scene. It was one of the goriest things I'd ever seen. And it wasn't just blood around the bed or on this person. The ceiling, the walls, and the floor, and uh, just unbelievable. Melinda tells police that she and David had been sleeping when two men burst into the room and began bludgeoning her husband right there next to her in bed. Detective Bill Wall recounts the gruesome scene as she described it. She was awakened by these horrifying sounds of someone striking her husband. Someone grabs her out of bed and pulls her downstairs. During this time, she hears one suspect say to the next, I think you hit him too hard, you may have killed him. Melinda tells police the intruders demand the keys to the bank where David works. She provides uh, the intruder downstairs with the, the bank keys. 
and then she's knocked unconscious. Claiming she had been knocked out for an hour, Melinda stumbles to the apartment of her next door neighbors, who call the police. When they arrive, detectives are immediately struck by three things. First, Melinda does not appear too concerned about her husband, David. She never asked anybody, what's the condition of my husband? She never asked. Then, Melinda asked the neighbors to make a call. She wants uh, the Bergstroms to call Mark Mangelsdorf, and he shows up. And when he gets there, just a few minutes later, police are struck by the fact that even though it's the middle of the night, Mangelsdorf's hair is wet. News of the gruesome murder reverberates throughout the small religious community. Kevin Jakabowski hears about his friend's death in church the next morning. I thought, you know, I'm going to get through this, and uh, I just fell apart. Police comb the area for clues as to who could have committed such a heinous crime. Time and again, they turn to the only two people with any possible link or motive, Melinda and Mark. But time and again, they are forced to turn away. The physical evidence just does not seem to be there. Melinda Harmon withdraws completely from public view, never speaking to David's parents again after his death. And Mark Mangelsdorf leaves town, the cloud of suspicion too much for him to bear. He seems more concerned about this than I thought he would be. But then again, if people are trying to charge you with murder, you probably would be. And he felt really cornered or marked or whatever and targeted. And, and uh, my point was, Mark, it's going to be all right. I mean, they'll, they'll, find, they'll figure out that you weren't involved. So don't sweat it. David Harmon, the gentle young man who loved his wife, friends, and church, is buried near all of them in a quiet spot just outside Ole. There would be no easy resolution to his murder, and his death would haunt investigators for 22 more years. Still to come, the police follow the trail back to Mark and Melinda when a soccer mom makes a startling accusation. In my heart, I know. Reigniting a cold case. Stay with us. It has been 23 years since David Harmon died at home in his bed, beaten beyond recognition, a victim of a crime so heinous it is difficult to fathom. In Columbus, Ohio, the widow's broken heart appears to have mended. Melinda Harmon has a new life. She's remarried now and has two children. She's a soccer mom. She's living a big, luxurious lifestyle. She's, she, uh, she's living large. She's just your perfect neighbor next door. In affluent Pelham, New York, a quiet suburb of Manhattan, Mark Mangelsdorf is living his new life. A married father of four, successful corporate executive, owner of a million-dollar home, and a graduate of Harvard Business School. But far away, out on the Kansas Plain, Olathe police never forgot their most notorious unsolved case. Johnson County District Attorney Paul Morrison. I think this case was sort of an open wound to this community of Olathe. It was a very, very brutal homicide. It was a senseless murder of uh, a young man that had a lot going for him, very religious, responsible, good guy. Police have always suspected Melinda and Mark, but for two decades, no arrests have been made. But in 2001, the Johnson County Crime Lab offers to run modern DNA tests on cold cases. The police immediately picked the Harmon case. But the police did not get the DNA magic they had hoped for. Much of the evidence had seriously deteriorated in the two decades since the murder. Despite a battery of tests, there still was no conclusive physical evidence tying Mark and Melinda to the murder. So the police decided to try something else. We needed a break. We needed someone to start talking. Olathe well, police decide to make a trip to this Tony Columbus, Ohio suburb, hoping, but never really believing, that Melinda Harmon will talk. She answers the door in her bathrobe. And we're kind of thanking each other, you know, hell, she's, she's going to come down the, the steps here and tell us to take a hike, but she doesn't. She invites us into her kitchen. The detectives tell Melinda they're investigating new evidence in her husband's murder, hinting that DNA has given new clues. The police are stunned when she decides to talk about it. When she started telling the story, and it wasn't the same story she told in 82, Steve and I look at each other like, whoa. We, we got something here. 
Police invite Melinda down to the station, and again they're surprised when she agrees to come. It is here that the mystery begins to unravel. Melinda makes her biggest mistake. She talks. And talks some more, finally admitting that her close friendship with Mark Mangelsdorf might have been inappropriate. And you would say, well, Mark, I'm flattered. I'm very flattered. And I was. What Melinda says next implicates her and Mark Mangelsdorf. In my heart, I know. But what you're telling me is, you didn't see his face, and you didn't hear his voice. Right. You saw a shape that matched him, mm -hmm. and your heart knew it was him. Mm -hmm. You actually got a chance to see that videotape. Right. I told him, I said, here's our uh, toehold that we need. Police now believe they have enough to charge someone with murder. But it's not Mark. To her surprise, it's Melinda. She had put herself at the scene of the crime. The defendant has been charged with the crimes of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. The defendant pleads not guilty to both charges. On April 13, 2005, was. Melinda Harmon goes on trial. About 2.33 a.m., David Harmon was beaten to death in his bed. The prosecution Probably leads off with the noises in the night, a murder so loud it woke the neighbors. They heard this jarring, thumping set of sounds in a sequence that lasted less than a minute, several of them, so jarring, so loud, that it woke them both up from a dead sleep. And then there's silence. For an hour, no screams, no cries for help from Melinda. In fact, key witnesses dispute Melinda's claim that she was knocked out that entire time. I would expect them to have amnesia both before being knocked out and afterwards and not being able to remember how they were knocked out. During that hour, prosecutors believe someone had time to clean up. The very top of the shower curtain tested negative for blood. As I proceeded down towards the bottom of the curtain, they became stronger. The strongest positive reaction for the benzene test was uh, obtained at the very bottom of the shower curtain near the hem where it's turned up and so. But the real key to the case was not physical evidence. There was very little. No real physical evidence. No real physical evidence. Basically, motive and a story that stunk. But what detectives did find could be viewed as extremely damning circumstantial evidence. Prosecutors produce love letters cementing the bond between Melinda and Mark. Well, these were just signed either Melinda or Love Melinda or I Love You Melinda, that type of thing. Evidence the defense felt it must confront head on. And in dramatic courtroom theater, to rebut the tales of an illicit relationship, the implications of cover up and murder over the option of divorce, Melinda's lawyers call Mark Mangelsdorf to the stand. Mangelsdorf testifying while knowing that anything he says can be used to convict him in his own trial. It was a gamble that only a very confident or innocent man can make. Let, let me be very clear. I was not in love with Melinda Harmon. I did not have a romantic or sexual or physical relationship with her. None of that. Melinda Harmon was my friend. And how about David Harmon? David Harmon was also my friend. Did you kill David Harmon? I did not kill David Harmon. Would it work? Was a face-to-face -face plea to the jurors enough? In the end, the jury foreman says Mark's gamble, his robotic demeanor and denials that seemed rehearsed, sealed Melinda's fate and may have endangered his own. If you're asleep and you wake up to somebody bludgeoning your spouse to death, would you just lay there? It'd be like something out of a horror movie. You'd say, oh my God, what's going on? That kind of stuff. We all would. After a two-and-a-half-week trial, the jury deliberates for just 12 hours. If you'll hand the verdict form to the bailiff, please. In a crowded Olathe courtroom, the verdict is read. The court will read the verdict of the jury. On count one, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder. On count two, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of conspiracy to commit murder. Out on the Kansas Plains, in the small town of Olathe, there is a new sense of freedom, a haunting murder finally solved because of detectives who never gave up and were smart enough to let Melinda Harmon 
Just talk. After Melinda's trial, Mark Mangelsdorf was also charged in David Harmon's murder. Melinda, who had been sentenced to life in prison, agreed to testify against him in exchange for a lesser charge. Both later pled guilty to second-degree murder and received sentences of 10 to 20 years. As of 2013, they're expected to serve only the minimum term. When we come back, a tragic accident. A hunter shot in the woods. I remember screaming for help. But some things just don't add up. He found a bullet hole in his back, and somebody wanted Mr. Dotson dead. Did his wife have a motive for murder? Stay with us. It was supposed to be a romantic getaway in the Colorado Rockies for Janice Dotson and her husband, Bruce, until a tragic hunting accident cut his life short. But as Chris Cuomo first reported in 2004, investigators noticed a few odd details and found themselves following a twisted trail that led to murder. As the sun rises on the second day of hunting season, a horrible scream pierces the Rocky Mountain silence. I saw orange in the distance lying on the ground. Janice Dodson runs to Bruce, her husband of just three months. He's bleeding, an orange hunting vest at his side. At that moment, I couldn't tell you what I thought had happened to him. He had been shot. Was he conscious when you found him? I remember screaming for help. I'd seen enough death to know when, when death was there in front of me. Camping nearby is Doug Kyle, a veteran cop who responds to her screams. He goes for a phone, knowing what Janice seems unable to accept. I said, I'm sorry. There's nothing we can do for him. He's gone. Go ahead, sir. There's a man been shot and killed up here. There was a man shot and killed up there? Yeah. 48 year old Bruce Dodson seems like a tragic casualty of the hunting season. Three months to the day after their marriage, Janice Dodson finds herself a widow. I spent a lot of time being angry with God. I spent a lot of time being angry with Bruce. I spent a lot of time being angry with myself. Friends couldn't believe the news, but what they knew was nothing compared to what they were about to find out. The day after Bruce Dodson was shot, an autopsy revealed he hadn't merely taken a single stray bullet. He'd taken three. We rolled Mr. Dotson over and we found a bullet hole in his back, which was not consistent with the bullet holes in the vest or the other clothing. District Attorney Investigator Bill Booth is present at the autopsy. What do you now start to believe about this killing? It's a homicide. And somebody wanted Mr. Dotson dead. When you were told this is no accident, this was a homicide, what did you think about how this could have happened? I couldn't believe it, that no one would First of all, kill someone like Bruce. And then my next thought was that no one deserves to die like that. They were supposed to grow old together. Bruce and Janice worked at the same hospital. She as a nurse, he a lab tech. Janice had been through a rough divorce and calls Bruce her savior. When he told me they were getting married, he was one happy man. <laughs> Friends say they make a great couple. Let's go. He's a penny pincher, helping her to put her affairs back in order after her divorce. She is lively and outgoing, introducing him to new things. As a couple, they were happy. They were active, energetic, out doing things, traveling. It's obvious to me that they were having a lot of fun. Maybe right about here when he was first shot. Bill Booth and his partner Dave yeah. Martinez were determined to find out who destroyed the happy couple. You have to be able to put the killer in a kill zone. The first puzzle to solve is how Bruce Dodson was gunned down. They turn to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation for forensic analysis of the bullet wounds. The paths those bullets took to the dead man's clothing tell investigators a frightening story. He was walking the fence line. He was walking the fence line, walked about here when the first shot was fired at him. And the first shot ripped through his vest. The bullet misses its mark, piercing Dodson's clothing, but only grazing his skin. I believe that Bruce Dodson got, got to this location, took his vest off, and started yelling. 
Hey! You believe he's waving it over his head because he's trying to uh, tell people, hey, I'm not a deer, don't shoot me. Correct. So he's now face to face with the shooter. That's what I believe. That's very cold blooded. Yes, it is. And then he takes it in the chest. Takes it around in the chest, which comes right out under his arm. And then not only gets shot facing, but now he probably gets shot in the back. Yes, he falls to the ground. The final shot coming through the fence post, the bullet separating, and a core from that bullet wound up hitting Mr. Dotson in the back, severing his spine. So where was the shooter? You see that post? See the hole? Police believed it was made by the third bullet. A string leads them to this spot, the assassin's nest, where they discovered a spent cartridge from a 308 caliber bullet, a different weapon than either Janice or Bruce were hunting with. What did you find early on that you found suspicious? Janice Dotson's ex-husband, J.C. Lee, was camped three quarters of a mile as a crow flies straight down his fence line. And what did you find out when you took a look at him? J.C. Lee had reported a 308 rifle stolen. Uh, he said it was stolen the day before this murder. We thought that was very suspicious. Was there any thought in your mind at all when you found out that J.C. Lee had been there, that he may have been involved with what happened to Bruce Dotson? There's a part of you that doesn't want to believe that someone you have children with, grandchildren with, would do something that devastating to hurt you. But did it come into your mind? Yes. District Attorney Frank Daniels admits he's fascinated with the case. In fact, he writes a book about it called Dead Center. If that shot had been two inches to the left, this case would have been chalked up as a hunting accident. I never would have seen it. There were two more shots fired, killing Bruce Dotson. But that first bullet had never been found, and investigators need it. You've got the fence post with a bullet hole in it. You've got the shell casing up in the clump of oak brush. You know where the victim was. Forensic experts show how they used fluorescent strings to estimate the bullet's path, starting at the sniper's nest, running through Dodson's vest and beyond, marking off a grid to search with a metal detector. Defying all odds, under several feet of brush, they find a 308 caliber bullet, matching the shell found in the sniper's nest, and more importantly, matching the type of rifle Janice's ex-husband reported stolen. When you find the bullet and find out it's a 308 caliber, mm -hmm. same rifle, could have come out of the rifle that was J.C. Lee's. Isn't that your man? Well, it's his rifle. It's the man's rifle. Investigators had the wrong guy. J.C. Lee has an alibi. His boss, along for the trip, confirms it, and it checks out. Investigators are back to square one. By a little stake in then, the Booth and Martinez realized something also. they'd overlooked before. Bruce and Janice's campsite was awfully close to Kyle the cop. We thought it was kind of rude that they would, you know, come on in and, and, and camp right in almost practically on top of where we were at. And yeah. that, that hits you as strange, right? Yeah, very strange. Because you don't want to camp near other hunters. Uh, this is millions of uh, acres up here, and uh, you don't camp next to them. Turns out it wasn't a random decision. Janice had been to the mountain without Bruce just a few weeks before. Was she there to plan a murder? Janice, the grieving widow, suddenly becomes the main suspect. What happens in your mind when the police start identifying you as a suspect? Unbelievable. How could they look at me? Uh, Investigators no, no. say the more they looked, the more they found incriminating Janice. She'd taken out three insurance policies. She made sure to get wills done. Bruce owned two homes. To have the property put into both their names during this three months since they were married. All the insurance is in your name. The will in your name. Funeral plans laid out already for Bruce. How do you explain that just three months into marriage? By the fact of me saying that Bruce took my, my pay, pay my life and help me organize some areas that I needed help in. She had this plan when she married him that she was going to kill him for his money. I believe that's why she married him. Did you kill Bruce Dodson? No, I did not. 
I had no reason to kill Bruce Dotson. Sure enough, investigators say soon after Bruce's death, Janice starts cashing in. She closes his bank accounts, settles his IRAs, and badgers the life insurance companies to pay off. Then she sells his home, his car, even his horse, Glory. Still, investigators need more. We had to put Janice with the gun, and we couldn't do that for a long time. The big break in the case would come from a piece of evidence the police had had since day one. Slogging through the mud in this pond looking for the rifle, investigators don't find the murder weapon, but do notice the mud consists of a special clay, bentonite, used as a liner in this man-made pond, the only place in the area with bentonite. We started thinking, the mud, Janice had mud on her, on her coveralls. The cops still had the dirty coveralls taken into evidence on the day of the murder, and a crime lab finds a match traces of bentonite. Why is that mud on your clothes? All the places that I crisscross from, there's no way that they could go to every place and see where I had walked that day. In the area where you were walking, the only place where that bentonite clay is, is where J.C. Lee was camping. I don't, and I don't know. I'm not a um, geologist. For authorities, it's the final link connecting Janice to the weapon by connecting her to J.C. Lee's camp. It was the littlest thing, uh, and it was overlooked for almost three years. Booth and Martinez arrest Janice. Who else falls into those categories of having means, motive, and opportunity to kill Bruce Dotson, except for Janice? But there's no motive. I didn't do it. And I can't say it enough. Bruce is still a victim. But the jury doesn't believe her and finds her guilty of first-degree murder. You loved Bruce Dodson. I still do. You understand what Bruce Dodson's final moments were like? Yes, I do. Whoever shot him had to shoot at him looking at him and then shoot him again when he turned away. The only way I can live with this is that I have the peace of knowing I didn't do it and the prayer in my heart that someday the truth will win out. Janice is now serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole for the murder of her husband. I think he was a good man. He was a nature photographer, liked to backpack, go hiking around, take pictures of the beauty of nature in western Colorado. And he liked to hunt? Well, no. John Bruce Dotson was really an animal lover. He uh, had never been big game hunting in his life. It was Janice who was the hunter. Janice Dotson appealed her sentence unsuccessfully, and she remains in prison. When we come back, a mysterious attack. I've been shot. My husband and I, we've been shot. And the killers tried it before. I'd like to uh, report a crime. My uh, brake lines have been cut. Someone had murder on their mind. Stay with us. Someone wanted Rob Andrew dead, and he thought he knew who it was. But that wasn't enough to save him. In 2002, Elizabeth Vargas first brought us this story of a man who saw his murder coming. The house at the end of the cul-de-sac in Oklahoma City seems ordinary, a good place to raise a family. Rob and Brenda Andrew and their kids, Tricity and Parker, lived here for a decade. But one night, shotgun blast shattered the quiet night. There was a frantic call to 911. I've been shot. My husband and I, we've been shot. Who shot you? And I don't know. They had on black masks. I don't know. Police rushed to the scene. The garage door was open and Rob Andrew on the floor. He was lying on his back. Uh, he appeared to have a couple of gunshot wounds, one to his torso and one up towards his neck. <laughs> Police have nothing to go on. Nothing is missing from the house. No clues about any masked gunman. And no motive for the shootings. As for Brenda Andrew, she has been shot in the arm with a pistol, but is still able to dial 911. Did she describe these two suspects? Uh, the only description she was able to give was uh, that the subjects were wearing black, uh, dark clothing, uh, and they had masks, dark colored masks on their 
on the covering their faces. With Thanksgiving just two days away, Rob Andrews' murder is added to the case file. But there are especially troubling questions. Is this a random murder or a cold-blooded execution? Why would anyone want to shoot Rob Andrew and his wife? Why did Brenda survive? Rob Andrew was an ad executive whose life revolved around his family, especially his children. At Christmas, he spoiled Tricity and Parker with gifts. There were vacations, a nice home, and lots of family time. Here, Tricity's learning to ride a bicycle. Parker loved to drive his toy car. Rob and Brenda had been married 17 years, but right from the start, Rob's parents, E.R. and Lou, say they knew that something was wrong with the storybook romance. Right after the honeymoon, he said, she told me she wished they hadn't got married or they was, it wasn't the right thing to do. Or From the very start? Yeah. Well, why would she marry him if she... I don't know. <laughs> Rob was uh, more affectionate toward Brenda than Brenda was toward Rob which made for an unbalanced marriage. Ronnie Stump was Rob's best friend. But for all intents and purposes, they were muddling through and making it as a married couple. It was one of those relationships that they would stay together because of the kids and, you know, work their way through it. We're happy all day long. We know Jesus loves us. That's why we sing the song. The family became very involved in their small Baptist church on the outskirts of town. It was at church that Rob and Brenda met Jim Pavat, a twice-married life insurance agent in his mid-40s. He was just kind of a very unassuming guy. You didn't really pay a lot of attention to Jim. Rob and Jim Pavat became friends, even went hunting together. At the same time, Pavat and Brenda started teaching Sunday school together. And then they suggested to Rob that he change his life insurance policy and that Pavat, their new friend, would write it. The next policy that Jim and Brenda got him to uh, write was 800000 Naming Brenda as the chief and sole beneficiary. That's correct. By summer, people were talking. Jim Pavat and Brenda seemed to be spending a great deal of time together. Several couples had spotted Brenda and Jim out eating lunch uh, together. Uh, another couple had seen Brenda and Jim uh, getting way too close uh, after church one night. Friends say Rob had heard too much. He accused Brenda and Jim of having an affair. She denied it, but very quickly, the marriage fell apart. We went out to dinner with them, and all, all four of them, and we had a real good time right here in Oklahoma City. And the next day is when she took the keys away from him and told him to leave. Did she have any explanation for why she threw him out of the house? Never admitted to that. In fact, she began shortly after that accusing Rob of having affairs. What was his reaction to all of this? Heartbroken. Brenda filed for divorce. It was a very nasty separation, full of angry confrontations, many of them over the children. Craig Box is Rob's divorce attorney. He would tell me of his conversations with his wife, and she had taken some rather extreme positions in dealing with the children, not letting him see the children, not letting him have the children even overnight or alone. Friends say it was heartbreaking for the father who loved to record his children's every birthday party and prompted them to love their mother. So when you grow up, Tricity, who do you want to be like? Mommy. Then, on the morning of October 26th, Rob got into his black Nissan. He immediately noticed he had no brakes. He drove slowly to the dealership, and there, Rob made a disturbing discovery and called 911. Oklahoma City Police Department. Hi there, I'd like to uh, report a crime. Uh -huh. My uh, brake lines have been cut for my car. Oh. That sounds like attempted murder, don't you think? Sergeant Mike Clicka was dispatched to the dealership. I looked at the brake lines on the front tires and they had one small slit on each front brake line. He said that he believed that his wife and her boyfriend were responsible for uh, cutting the brake lines. He called me right after that, and I could tell he was shaken. Uh, he, he was, uh, you could tell in his voice, he was scared. Rob rented a car and at his office picked up an urgent voicemail message. Mr. Andrews, please come to the Miller Hospital. Your family's here. Miller 
He raced to the hospital, but it's a hoax. His family wasn't there. It seems someone wanted Rob to get into his car and drive it at high speed. They were just trying to get him on the highway so that he'd crash. With his cut brake lines. With his cut brake lines. Uh, they didn't know that he'd already changed cars. So I had uh, told Rob to be very careful because we didn't know if they were waiting for him there or what was going on. When we come back, Rob Andrews' worst fears come true and Brenda disappears. Thursday, she didn't call. No. Friday, she didn't call. No. Saturday, Sunday. No. And were Rob Andrews' last words a clue to his killers? I heard what I believe was the garage door coming up. He said, I'm going to have to let you go. They're coming out. Stay with us. When Rob Andrew found the brake lines of his car slashed, he thought his wife Brenda was trying to kill him, hoping to collect on his life insurance. So he decided to take her name off his policy. But that proved to be more difficult than he imagined. And it wouldn't be enough to keep him safe. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. Rob Andrew quickly found out that he couldn't change the beneficiary on his $800,000 policy. At least, that's what his insurance agent, Jim Pavat, apparently told him. So Rob went over Pavat's head and began making the changes with Pavat's supervisor. Then Rob's phone rang. He received a call from his wife, angry, inquiring why he was changing his beneficiary. That's when James Pavat called him and told Rob at that point in time if he thought his wife was mean, he hadn't seen anything yet until he dealt with him. That conversation, along with his slashed brake lines, led Rob to file a police report claiming his wife and Pavat were conspiring to kill him for the insurance money. But police apparently did nothing. With Thanksgiving approaching, Rob tried to focus on the holiday weekend when he would be with his children. But it wasn't easy. Brenda wanted them to say they didn't want to go. And she bought Tricity a little puppy, which Tricity loves dogs. And she told her, if you stay here with me, you can keep the puppy here. But if you go with your dad, you can't take it. She chose to go with her dad anyway. You believe that that must have really angered Brenda. I think that it hurt her. She just, uh, she just couldn't let them go. On the afternoon of November 20th, Rob left his friend Ronnie Stump a phone message. Ronnie, it's Rob. Thanks for checking. It's been kind of carried all day today. I am on my way to pick up my children and uh, play with them for a long weekend. So give me a call if uh, you get a minute. Thanks. Bye. It was just before 6 p.m. when Rob drove to the house he shared for a decade with Brenda. He waited in the driveway for the children. He again called Ronnie on his cell phone. The two spoke for a few minutes, and then... I heard what I believe was the garage door coming up. He said, I'm going to have to let you go. They're coming out. And that was the last I heard from him. Rob then apparently stepped out of his car and into the garage. Moments later, someone with a 16-gauge shotgun opened fire, hitting Rob in the neck and torso. Brenda, shot once in the arm, that's the bullet hole in the door, went back into the house where the children were and called police. 911. Hi. Uh, I've been shot. My husband and I, we've been shot. Okay, calm down, ma'am. You just shot you. They, uh, I don't know. They had on black masks. I don't know. Where's your husband shot? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I can't, it looks like his shirt. It's all ripped. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Ronnie rushed to the house. You told him everything that night, the detective, on the scene. You told everything him that... Everything that I knew about the cut brake lines. The, the bad divorce, the fighting, the tension, the insurance know, policy. The threats and everything. I shared that with the detective that night. Gary Damron and Roland Garrett are the lead detectives on the case. She was a victim and a witness. Victim first, witness second. You did know that Rob, in fact, was afraid for his life. He'd filed two police reports saying, I think my wife is trying to kill me. Why didn't you look at her with more suspicion? We looked at her with suspicion, but we still, uh, upon investigating the, the crime scene and the incident just after it happened, we did not have enough probable cause to place her under arrest. To me, it was blatant. It was obvious that 
these are the people that took this man's life and nobody was doing anything about it. Investigators met briefly again with Brenda the next day, the day before Thanksgiving. She said she would call to set up a formal interview. Did she call? No, she didn't call. Thursday she didn't call? No. Friday she didn't call? No. Nope. Saturday? Sunday? No. Nope. Did you call her? No. Nope. Did you try and talk to Jim Pavat? We tried to contact him. Wasn't able to make any contact. Nonetheless, police apparently were not worried about where Brenda and the children were. They had told us that they would be back after the holiday and, and would proceed with the investigation. E.R. Andrew is Rob's father. We were concerned, but they assured us that they had had a surveillance, they knew where they were. In fact, police admit Brenda wasn't under surveillance. No one was watching her throughout the entire Thanksgiving holiday weekend, right up until Monday morning when she and her two children failed to show up for Rob's funeral. You thought they were fugitives? Yes, right from the minute I heard that. But police were still not convinced that Brenda was on the run. You didn't think a mother of two was going to flee the country or flee the city or flee the state? No, I didn't. The detectives were wrong. It would be three days before police finally issued warrants charging Brenda and Jim Pavat with Rob's murder. The FBI joined the manhunt, but a key question remained. Why would Brenda kill her husband? Why not just divorce him? Looking back, I think that she did not want to lose control of the kids, and she knew there would be a custody battle, and I, I believe that Brenda thought that if he was just out of the picture, that would be the end of it. Three months after Brenda Andrew vanished, the FBI tracked her and James Pavat to Mexico and brought them back to Oklahoma. Both were convicted of first-degree murder and given the death penalty. They have appealed unsuccessfully. The Andrew children went to live with Rob's parents, and both are doing well. As of 2013, Parker is in college, and Tricity is in graduate school on a fellowship. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.